Eternal God, the heavens declare your glory, and all creation sings your praise. You've gathered us from our many paths and destinations into your holy church, a sign of your new creation. Gather us today also by your Holy Spirit from the many places from which we lift our hearts to you, so that we may worship and adore you with one heart and one voice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is Matthew 10, 24 to 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have been called to the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear, hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid, you are more valuable than many sparrows. 
Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before, my other, before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring peace. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves a uh, son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who will find life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. influential Baptist theologians of the last 50 years was a man named James William McClendon. Like many Baptist theologians, he was not only a professor, but also a pastor. He wrote a book about his experience serving as the interim pastor of a church. The title of the book is called Making Gospel Sense to a Troubled Church. Now, before you get anxious that I'm using a title that mentions troubled church in a sermon, let me put your mind at ease. Professor McClendon said that calling a church a troubled church is not necessarily a negative thing. He wrote, every church has trouble. The important thing is that it be gospel trouble. What is gospel trouble? Gospel trouble 
is not the kind of trouble you get in when you're doing something wrong. Gospel trouble is the kind of trouble that arises from doing what is right. Gospel trouble is when following Jesus brings us face to face with the structures of the world that rejected and crucified Jesus. Gospel trouble is when living out the good news of the kingdom of heaven meets resistance from people who have made their peace with the kingdoms of earth. The implications of gospel trouble are that we can be doing exactly what God wants us to do and still face opposition not in spite of doing God's will, but because of doing God's will. Every church has trouble. The important thing is that it be gospel trouble. This is the theme of Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 10. In this chapter, Jesus instructs his disciples about the mission of the church in the world. Jesus taught them to do the same work that Jesus himself does. He sent them to announce the good news that the kingdom of heaven is available now on earth. He gave them authority to demonstrate the presence of the kingdom by healing sickness and by casting out evil powers that robbed people of life and blessing. Jesus' life sets the pattern for our lives. We are to carry out his work of bringing the good news of heaven to earth. Years ago, when the Apple computer company was just getting started, the investors in the company convinced Steve Jobs that they needed an experienced CEO to grow the company. They decided that the CEO of Pepsi was the right person for the job. But he was hesitant to leave one of the world's largest companies and become the CEO of what was then a very young startup computer company. During the end of their negotiations, Steve Jobs finally said to the CEO of Pepsi, look, you can spend the rest of your life selling sugar water, or you can come with us and change the world. Everywhere he went, Jesus changed the lives of people who recognized in him the work of God and who put their trust in God's work. Jesus invites us to come with him and be a part of God's work of changing the world. There is no more exciting or inspiring work than that. But Jesus wants us to be prepared. There are people and powers who are deeply invested in the world the way it is now. These powers resisted Jesus and they will resist us as well. In the scripture Keith read for us this morning, Jesus teaches us to be prepared for the trouble that comes from joining in his work. A disciple is not above the teacher Jesus says. Jesus makes it clear that we can expect the same kind of resistance that met him. When Jesus healed people, some suspected that he had ulterior motives. When he announced God's forgiveness, people questioned his credentials. When he welcomed outcasts, People criticized his lax moral standards. When he cast out demons, people called him the prince of demons. 
when he walked on water, there were probably people who said, Jesus can't swim. We're invited to do the same work that Jesus does. And we should expect the same resistance Jesus received. Jesus forgave sins. There are people who are invested in labeling whole groups of people as being unforgivable. Jesus cured people's illnesses. There are people who are invested in keeping access to healing expensive, unaffordable for many, and expensive for all. Jesus welcomed social and religious outcasts. There are people who protect their own position as insiders by labeling and excluding whole groups of people as outsiders, denying access to education and voting and equal protection under the law. The Gospels are clear, however, that when people draw lines to keep themselves in and others out, Jesus often takes his stand with the outsiders. When we join the work of Jesus, we will meet the same resistance that Jesus received. Every church has trouble. The important thing is that it be gospel trouble. What does Jesus want his disciples to know about how to deal with gospel trouble? First, Jesus says, don't be afraid of people whose opinions will not have the final say. Nothing is covered, Jesus said, that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. God is the only one who has the final say, and God's judgment has already been made known in the resurrection of Jesus. The one who has the final say over our lives is the same one who laid down his life for us. We can't let fear of opposition keep us from taking our public stand with Jesus for the good news. Verses 32 and 33 give a warning about denying Jesus before others. This is an uncomfortable word. There are times when we can be and have been intimidated by angry crowds who are afraid to let go of the way things are now. We should remember that the very disciples Jesus originally gave these words to also denied him and fled from him when he was arrested and crucified. Jesus does not require that we have a perfect record of standing publicly with him 100%. But Jesus does expect that there is a record somewhere of our standing publicly with the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God. Second, Jesus warns us that there's one division that we simply can't avoid. In verse 34, Jesus says, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. This is a difficult say. We all know that there's already far too much division in our world. 
and that there's far more common ground than we've been able to find so far. We also know from the Gospels that Jesus is gentle, loving, and kind. What did Jesus mean by bringing a sword? What Jesus means is that he refused to make a false peace with a world bent on keeping an unjust status quo. The sword that Jesus brings is the sword that the world brings out against him and people who follow him who refuse to settle for less than the kingdom of heaven. Another way of saying this is what we find in verse 38. Jesus says, Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The cross and the sword are the world's violent ways of resisting the kingdom of God. The cross was the Roman Empire's way of saying to conquered people, stay in line and don't make trouble or else this is what you'll get. The cross was a threat to intimidate anyone from challenging the status quo. Jesus said, if we seek to find our lives on the world's terms by avoiding the cross, we will lose it. But if we lose our lives for Jesus' sake, by taking up our cross, we will find it. Far too often, the church has feared the cross and taken up the sword. And when we've done that, we become a part of the very problem that Jesus is trying to solve. Jesus tells us that if we take up our cross, we'll learn not to be afraid of the sword. Gospel trouble is when living out the good news of God's kingdom brings us under the threat of the cross. Jesus took the threat of the cross, however, and made it into the throne of an entirely new kingdom of love and grace. I have to admit, these words of Jesus are hard for me. I don't like trouble at all. I'm a very cautious person. My favorite book of the Bible is the book of hesitations. If it were up to me, the words of the Old Testament prophet would be, let justice just kind of drip down drop by drop so nobody gets upset. But that's not what the scriptures say. And that's not what Jesus calls us to do. The call of Jesus is to live out the good news in such a way that we will live under the threat of the cross. Every church has trouble. The important thing is that it be gospel trouble. The call of Jesus is expressed so well in the song that Grace sang for us this morning. It represents the summons of Jesus to his followers. Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare? Should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you 
in me. Remember these words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Loving God, your Son stood in the midst of his disciples on Easter Sunday and spoke the words, Peace be with you. As we continue to cope with a global pandemic, economic crisis, and the reality of deep injustice in our community and nation, we long to hear in our hearts your word of peace today. Help us to know the reality of Jesus' resurrection, the peace of your presence, and the hope of your conquering love. Redeeming God, you called us to continue the work of Jesus in a world that rejected and crucified him. Give us faith in your overcoming love and resurrecting power. Help us to believe beyond our frailties and to have courage to stand for your truth. Guide us by your spirit to speak the truth in love and to give bold witness to your life-giving kingdom. Merciful God, around us we see many people working to help others with needs, great and small. Thank you for your goodness that comes to us in many ways, seen and unseen. Give strength, perseverance, and relief to all engaged in works of mercy, healing, and care. Give us generous hearts to share gifts of time, service, kindness, and patience with one another. And open our hands to share your blessings of material provisions with our neighbors. Listening God, we ask your help for people suffering from COVID-19 and all forms of illness, for people grieving the deaths of their loved ones, for people who are isolated, lonely, and anxious. Guide us to know how to live as people of faith and hope in difficult times. We pray for all who endure injustice in many forms and pledge our solidarity with the whole community of your people. We ask these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide, bless, and keep you always. And as you go forth to love and serve God in the world, May the peace of Christ always be with you. Amen.